We are here to work out a little bit of what it means to follow Christ and why that's important for the rest of our life. And uh, we're going to talk about it because I think we're wired to have a little bit in us about the need for a comeback story that was illustrated last Sunday in a great way when Tiger Woods won the Masters, right? Yeah, it was a big, big moment. Now, if you followed golf, or even if you didn't follow golf, you know who Tiger Woods is. I mean, he's one of the greatest golfers in the last 50 years, if not the greatest. He's amazingly talented. And uh, he also has done a lot of things to shoot himself in the foot personally. A lot of stupid things, a lot of things that uh, we seem to forgive him for pretty easily. And, and that, he just, he's just like Superman. It's like even when Superman messes up, it's like, oh, he's Superman. It's okay, you know, because he's going to come back. And he came back after surgeries. He had back surgeries and knee surgeries. And there was many that thought that he would never, ever be able to golf again. And he didn't think he would be able to golf again. So for him to win the most difficult uh, test in golf when he won the Masters tournament last week, it was a nut house. People are cheering, grown men are crying and hugging people they don't even know. Oh, <laughs> Tiger won, you know? It's one of those things. So we are wired to want a comeback story, something that was dead to come to life. And you say, well, doesn't that kind of invalidate a little bit the claims of the resurrection? Not at all. It's just we're wired to understand that when something is dead, it shouldn't be alive. But when it comes alive and for a good cause, then we are inclined to cheer. But I'm going to give you a little more than that, a little more than something to cheer about. I'm going to give you something to think about. Because we're in the, we're in the last week of a series called One Minute with Jesus. And what happened throughout the Bible was... We, we see glimpses of when people spent just one minute with Jesus, not a whole lot of time. A lot of times they didn't get much of his time, but in those moments, lives were completely changed. People would be healed. Blind men that couldn't see could suddenly see. People that couldn't walk could suddenly walk because of one minute with Jesus. And then there were some times where his one minute conversations were more like questions. They would ask him a question and he would come back with a question. And we're going to talk about the three questions that I believe that we need to understand and get to the heart of on this Easter season so that we can live the life that God has designed for us to live. But before we do that, I want to share with you my favorite Easter cartoon because there's a lot of confusion of Easter bunnies, chocolate bunnies, Easter eggs. Do bunnies have eggs? And I like this, this cartoon. Take a look. This is my favorite. All right. All right. They just. <laughs> and uh, all right. <laughs> Isn't that good? You share my joy. I hear it. All right. But can I tell you something? Unlike the Tiger Woods story, that in 30 years, some of us golf fans may remember, in 50 years, there will be very few that will ever talk about it. Here we are 2,000 years after the resurrection, and we're still talking about it. Amen? There was something different. It wasn't just a historical thing that happened. It was a transformational event that all of human history hinged upon. And I, and I want to talk about the questions that Jesus would ask us if he were here. And so let me run through the three questions. We've talked about the last three weeks, and if, if these questions pique your interest, I want you to go online and get on the website and look at what we've been talking about for the last three weeks. But I promise this one will stand alone, and it'll be you know, making sense you, for you before we're done. The questions, the first one was the question of truth. These are questions that I need to ask myself. Is my life based on the ultimate truth revealed in Jesus Messiah, or is my life based on a truth that, and reality that I've come up with on my own? We have to answer that question. Where do we have our truth basis? Secondly, we have to answer the question of authority. Do I live my life firmly under the authority of Jesus or do I live and feel like I have the right to second guess and pass judgment on Jesus? Now, this is an important question because it gets to the root of, of how we believe that if, if there is a sovereign God, how do we relate to him? We talked about that last week. And this week, we're gonna talk about a question maybe you've not thought about, and that's the question of orbit. And here's the question. Does my life revolve around Jesus and his desires for this world, or does my life show that I expect Jesus to act according to my needs? In other words, is, is he on my speed dial when I, when I really need him, 
Or is he at the center of who I am? Do I follow him as the voice that would guide me into truth? Do I follow him as the authority of my life? Do I, do I follow him when he prods and processes for me to do a certain thing? And I, and I thought it'd be easier for me to draw it for you, this idea or the question of orbit. So I'm just kind of take a look real quick. And um, I, I look at the worldviews that we have kind of in the world today. The first worldview, if, if you were to ask anybody on the street, these four would pr pretty much be represented. Uh, no God, the atheistic worldview, the agnostic worldview, not sure. This is, comprises a, a growing number of young adults that would put themselves here and old adults. They, and then Buddhism is, is over in this quadrant. In this quadrant of worldviews, you would have the one God people like Judaism and Islam, but no Jesus. They don't believe that Jesus is in fact God in the body. And so they would reject Jesus as any kind of savior, but they would accept there's one God, and then there are the many gods, the, the multi-theistic go um, gods that you have from history and also Hinduism today. Now, I'm not going to tell you why I believe these two are off base. There are books for that. There are, there are investigations that you can do on your own time, but I'll just suffice to say that these are the non-Christian worldviews, and these two down here are pretty much where most people in America would say that they lived, although a growing number is up here. Okay, down here, I am at the center of my universe, and Jesus is, is kind of, he's kind of, kind, of, kind of flowing with me. Wherever I go, he's there. Kind of like my good buddy in the sky, kind of like the old man upstairs, you know, kind of like he's there when I need him. He's on speed dial. He's my 911. He's, he's that. He's that for me. There is a relationship happening, but it's a very surface relationship. It's very me-centric. And then there's the other which I believe is the biblical model for what you and I are called to live like, and that is where Jesus is, in fact, Lord of my life, and I revolve, I orbit his desires for my life because if I believe he is truly God in the body, if I truly believe that he, he is the creator of the, co-creator of the universe, if you will, then he's got to know better what is good for my life than I know for my life. And the best way to have the good life is to put Jesus at the heart of everything I do. I give him authority. I accept him as truth. And I orbit. I, 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 I stay connected to Jesus. Now, Dave Smith pointed out to me that my arrows are a little bit backwards. And I, I didn't mean to do this. But this is really a cool truth because here's, like when I'm putting Jesus out here, I'm kind of like going with the flow of the rest of the world. But when I declare Jesus as my Lord, I'm kind of countercultural, counterclockwise. I'm going against the flow of what everybody else expects and what everybody else does. And if you truly live with Jesus as the center of your life, you will stand out in a culture that says, let's just go with the flow, right? So that's, that's the way I'm looking at orbit. And the question I think can only be understood is why does this make sense is, the, is when you think about gravity. So let me put gravity as the word, is the key component to why I believe staying in orbit around Jesus is the only right way to live. Okay, I know I'm getting a little scientific here, and, and you just go with me, okay? Let's just consider the earth for a minute. The earth is not the center of the solar system. We rotate around the sun, but in our little neck of the woods, we have a moon that goes around the earth. It stays right in the right place, Right? Because the gravity of the earth is, is so much bigger because it's larger. The mass of the earth is larger than the moon, and so the moon is held there mysteriously. Gravity is an unbelievable, invisible force. The only thing that we can kind of compare it to is magnetism, another invisible force that we can't explain but we understand is real. So it is held in place by a larger body, the moon is. Just like you and I are held in place when we're in a right relationship with Jesus, through his love, through his church, through his word, all of these things are hanging on. And when we live that way, life makes the most sense. Because if Jesus is truly God in the body, to not listen to him would be dumb. To not order my life around him would be a less than desirable way to live. In fact, this way of living right here, when I do my own thing, and I expect Jesus to just follow me around. It's when I get hurt. It's when I suffer. <laughs> it's when I hurt other people. Because if I'm the center of my own universe and I'm living around people that are in the center of their own universe, guess what? There are kingdoms in conflict every day, right? But if we're all in agreement here in the church that Jesus is the Lord of our life, 
then life makes sense and makes us better at life and all of that. So let me, let me get to the scripture. I've kind of walked you through the, my thought. The reason Christians get excited about Easter is they are center, they're, they're celebrating the center of their reality. They're, we're ce- celebrating the centering point in history. But I know that in a crowd this size, some of you here today would say, in all honesty, Pastor, Jesus is not the center or the Lord of my life. And I, wanna, I want you to understand you're in a good place today. Because I, I want to declare a couple of scripture points that we can look at of people who did declare Jesus Lord. They did order their life around him. And he was able to help them see the full truth. Because here's the big idea today. When you seek Jesus as Lord, he makes himself clearly known to you. If you'll say, okay, God, if you're real, if you're really the big man in the sky, but you're also God in the body in Jesus Christ, if all, I will follow you. How, 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 how I do that, I don't know. But if you'll reveal yourself to me. And so every Easter, let me give me two ideas today. Every Easter, Jesus, number one, offers his presence to those who seek him as Lord. Every Easter. He offers his living presence to those who will seek him as Lord. You say, well, not everybody finds him. But, well, because not everybody seeks him as Lord. Some people just want information. And Jesus is all about transformation. And I want to look at two stories in the Bible that show us that. The first one is from a, a lady named Mary Magdalene. And the Bible tells us in another passage that Mary had a sordid past. She, she was once host to seven demons And Jesus had cast those demons out of her, so she was into some bad stuff, and she knew Jesus was her only answer and her Savior. So when he was crucified and laid in the tomb, she was sad. It says in John 20, Now Mary stood outside the tomb, crying as she wept. She bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Well, they've taken my Lord away, she said. And I don't know where they put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't realize it was Jesus. You know, sometimes Jesus shows up in our life in disguise. And sometimes when we think he's far away, he's right next to us. This is one of those things. But grieving, as Mary was doing, sometimes clouds are, are a view of what's really happening. So he asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Again, thinking he was the gardener, unable to look up through her grief to see Jesus, she said, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him, and I'll get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. Her eyes were opened, and she turned to him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. She was finally able to look up from her grief in this first Easter Sunday and remember the Jesus that she knew as Lord was actually right in from right in front of her and he'll he'll Jesus will go out of his way to confirm his presence to those of us who will declare him Lord and what does Mary Magdalene say well she runs back to the disciples with the news I have seen the Lord I've seen the Lord. I've seen my Lord. I've seen the center of my universe, and he is alive. And one of the cool things and the reason we still talk about this 2,000 years later is that every one of these people that saw him alive were willing to go to their grave, in fact, give their life for the fact that they knew him as alive. They knew that it was true. They knew that it was real because they, it wasn't the empty tomb that convinced them. It was his living presence with them that ultimately convinced them of the reality of who he was. And Jesus will get to your heart if you let him today. If you'll ask him, if you're real, Jesus, I'll make you Lord of my life. Last night we had our first Easter service. For those that couldn't attend on Sunday, we had a Saturday night gathering and we had a bunch of people show up and it was awesome. And after the service, a young man came up with his family and said, Pastor, you don't know me, but I want to thank you. About eight weeks ago, something amazing happened. I brought my younger brother with me to church and 
And I've been after him for a long time to come to church because he's struggling. He's a veteran of Iraq and Afghanistan, and he'd, he'd done two tours there, and he's come back broken. And uh, so I, I finally got him to come to church with me after spending time with him a long, a long time before that. Just, just get him here. And in the middle of your sermon, you stopped the sermon, and you said these words, somebody here is going through a very dark and difficult time and you need to pause right now and consider Jesus as your Lord and make him Lord of your life. And I think I might have even prayed in that moment, in the middle of the sermon, and I kept on preaching. He said, when you did that, my little brother gave his heart to Jesus. Here's the kicker. He said, this is my first trip back into church since after that decision he made for Jesus, two weeks later, the Lord took him home. And he's just bawling his eyes out telling me this last night. And he said, I want to thank you for being obedient to that voice that invited that one person because that one person was my brother and now he is in eternity with Jesus because he had that last minute opportunity. See, Jesus will offer his presence to those who will seek him as Lord. He'll, he'll show up in your life when you need him, if you're open to it, if you're listening to him. And secondly, Jesus will not only offer you his presence, he'll offer his proof to those who seek him as Lord. He'll, he'll prove it to you enough to where you know who you're talking to is Jesus. In fact, it happened with Thomas. We, we kind of refer to Thomas in the Bible as doubting Thomas. This is why, because of this scripture. Because Jesus, after he had rose again, he had appeared to some of his disciples, and Thomas was the last one who didn't see him. He says, now Thomas, also called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I seal the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side where the spear went, I'm not going to believe. He was a doubting guy. He wanted proof, right? So a week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked. I don't get this one. This is Jesus going through matter. Jesus came and stood among them. Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, I mean, he goes right over to Thomas, the doubter. Put your finger here in my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Now you see, Mary and Thomas both refer to Jesus as their Lord. They weren't waiting for him to chase them down. He was proving himself to them. He was giving his presence to them. And he will still do the same for us. And if Jesus is who he said he is, there is no middle ground. If he is truly God in the flesh, he must be worshipped. You know, you and I don't get to choose to worship. We get to choose what we worship. Because we're going to worship something, whether it's our career, whether it's our family, whether it's our possessions, we're going to worship something. It's what we give our time and our treasures to. But when we, the only way to live this way is when we worship Jesus. So when Mary said, my Lord and my God, and Thomas said, my Lord and my God, they were referring to a way of life. And Jesus then said in verse 29, because you have seen me, you've believed. He said this to Thomas. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That would be us. Jesus said, even though we've never seen him in bodily form, I don't know if any of you have, I haven't talked to anybody that has, but that what I've seen from Jesus is enough. He has communicated with me that he is alive. I've put my faith in him that he is alive and he is my Lord. And in that transaction, when I declare Jesus Lord of my life, there is enough faith that gets poured back into me that I can stand up here and say with conviction that Jesus is alive because I know he's alive. Because I know him personally and I want you to know him personally. And the way to get to know him personally is to make him Lord of your life. 
and to be in right orbit, to be in connection with the God of the universe. And don't expect everything to be easy. A lot of people, they come to Christ and they think, well, things are going to be easy now. That's what the Christians say. We don't say that. We just say when you stay in right orbit, you know, just like the moon (laughs) around the earth. The moon's taken asteroids over the years. Have you ever looked at the moon and saw those big craters? Yeah, you know, kind of like when you get in the front of the mirror, you see the hail damage all over your body as you get older. You're like, it's kind of like the, the surface of the moon appears on your body. <laughs> as a Christian, there are things that come at us from this world that we don't like, that are painful. But you know what? If we hang in there with Jesus and hang on to Jesus, Jesus will hang on to us. And what else helps me is God's word. When I read God's word, I don't run from Jesus, I run to Jesus, we stay connected. When I get together and I worship with you guys on the weekend, and when I get on podcasts of pastors that I love to listen to that draw me closer to God, this is what helps me stay connected to him. And the church, the church is, we are the people that that surround Jesus, but the church on a daily basis, where we, we engage our faith, this is what keeps us in right relationship. But when we cross these things out of our life, It's easier for us to just start spinning out, doing our own thing, and we lose our center. And the gravitational pull of Jesus is voluntary, remember. He'll stay connected to us, but it's our free will that connects back to him. And for some of you today, maybe it's been a while since you've declared Jesus Lord of your life, or maybe you've never done that. I want to introduce you to Scott Headley. Scott is a... Going to show up on video. His testimony is an amazing testimony of a person that thought he was walking with Jesus, but then something really difficult came into his life. And as you hear his story, I want you to understand that the same Jesus that touched him is available to touch you today. My entire life, I thought that I was a Christian. And I would show up to church periodically. There was no foundation to to my belief whatsoever. And 2007 is when when, uh, life really took a turn for me uh, for the worst. First of all, in March of 07, my mother passed away unexpectedly. And uh, that was devastating for me. I felt so alone. And then shortly after that, a couple months following, I lost my grandmother, who was like a second mother to me. They were uh, the foundation for me when it came to my relationship with God. I relied on their relationship rather than one that I'd built on my own. And then December 13th, 2007, um, at 3.30 in the afternoon, uh, one of my offices were robbed and um, my employees were duct taped, they were um, placed in a bathroom and they were lit on fire and um, and it burned to death in a a horrible event. At that point, something snapped. I I felt I had everything I could take. I, I shut down, all my emotions left and rather than running to God, I I ran from God, and I made bad decisions, and one of which I had always struggled with um, alcohol my entire life. Uh, It had been part of fun events for me, but at this point, alcohol didn't become an option. It became a a way of life for me, and all I wanted to do was, was numb the pain. All I wanted to do was isolate, and um, I didn't want anybody around me. I didn't want anybody to care for me, and I certainly didn't want to care for anyone. I guess in my mind was that if I stopped caring, losing them would hurt less. Finally, one morning I woke up and I had looked up in the mirror briefly to brush my teeth, and I remember lowering the the toothbrush and really taking a look at the reflection that was looking back at me, and it was empty. I knew that if I didn't do something, that I would be the next person that was going to be buried. I went to uh, a detox 
for seven days, and then I was moved to a um, rehab facility. So week seven of, of rehab, I had graduated slowly to a point that uh, you're given a little more freedoms and a little more responsibility. This particular evening, we left the administration building where we did a lot of, they did a lot of uh, the education portion. I remember grabbing my jacket for whatever reason and I headed out the door as quickly as I could and gathered with the rest of the, of the, the guys. There was 12 other guys, so myself, 12 other men and, and a quote unquote counselor, they called him. As we walked out to the parking lot, he told me that we were going to the beach. It was about nine o'clock at night and um, we came to a pavilion that sure enough was right on the sand uh, by the ocean. And as he gathered us there, he told us the subject that we were there to consider was higher power. And I remember him saying as bullheaded as most of us were, how about we go down there and we look at the ocean and at least realize that we're not God. And, and I did. I found, um, I found uh, the, my spot and um, for the first time, I really did look at the water. I felt so insignificant. And at that moment, the wind began to blow, a wind I've never felt before in my life. And I went down slowly to one knee, and the most powerful feeling came over me. I felt myself in a light. I felt everything being pulled from me. It started at my feet, and it worked through my body, and it was all being pulled out. The anger, the loneliness, the guilt, the alcohol, everything was coming out while at the same time, I was being filled from the feet up with a whole new light. Everything good was coming in and everything started to change from there. And I heard, it's gone. It's in the deepest part of this ocean and you never, ever have to take it back unless you choose to take it back. I'm not sure why this happened to me on the beach. I don't know, I'm so thankful. I don't think it was because I'm someone special. To be honest, I think it's because I was a worst case scenario. Anything short of that, I don't know if it would have even worked. But my entire life changed. I was reborn that night on that beach.